welcome to our YouTube live and uh, this is one where I don't have to do two in a week which is great we had the Bank of England we had the Fed last week and this got shuffled over to the next week as a result so welcome we'll have an hour together and really this is your chance to ask any question you like about investment and I scrabble to answer uh, usually I do a fairly good job uh, but let's see how we do tonight and um, Somebody says it's Bubby time. Yes, Teddy is probably still downstairs. I usually bring Teddy up um, if there's a kind of gap, but uh, let's see how we get on tonight. Um, so in terms of what's going on in markets at the moment, I think um, I just saw that the repo market, the reverse repo market in the US, uh, the Fed's reverse repo facility just dropped below $1 trillion for the first time in a very long time. So that um, bid for safety, and yield is no longer there or at least not as strong as it was and we are st starting to see that normalize which is probably a sign of healing in a way but also because interest rates are now higher you can just buy a treasury and get a pretty good yield so that's normalization it's nice to see that bank of england you know to summarize what they said higher for longer probably Inflation is still sticky, growth essentially non-existent for the next three years, not great. Compare that with the US, an overheating economy with very low unemployment and a labour market which is on fire. So very different stories from the two different central banks. But um, there are similarities, of course, which is that core inflation is still a problem and wage growth is still inconsistent with a 2% target. So there is that in common. Uh, Tom's personal finance says good evening good evening Tom um, and yeah so if you do want to ask a question of course you have to be one of our subscribers um, and but if you do want to have your question answered at the front of the queue a super chat obviously helps us financially and uh, it obviously uh, gets pushed to the front of the queue if you're one of our supporters on YouTube also you'll be pushed to the front of the queue and we can tell because you've got a little crown next to your name due to the plumbing in YouTube. Brilliant. So let's see what we've got for questions. And we'll just see if we've got any super chats. Not yet. So a couple of things to mention, just kind of uh, in passing. Next Tuesday, so less than a week away, I'm doing a webinar and it's free. Uh, but you have to register and there'll be a link in the description below with C bonds, which is like a very, very advanced database for bonds. And we'll probably use C bonds to illustrate some of the ideas I'll be talking about. But really, it's to talk about money markets versus government bonds, both in the UK, the US, elsewhere. Because the difficult choice now is do you lock in a rate for a longer period of time or do you simply milk the short end of the curve with the money market fund, which is very low maintenance? And it's not an easy question to answer, I don't think. It's not obvious. So I'll talk about the drivers. I'll talk about where I think things are going and which I think is best um, in the webinar. So if you do want to learn about um, fixed income, then I think that could be quite an opportunity to go a bit deeper than usual. Usually when I'm talking about bonds, I try to keep it non-technical, but for this one, I will dial it up a bit in terms of complexity because it is a, a more sophisticated audience, I think. At least that's what I expect. Anyway, so if you want to register for that, free to do it, but you have to register beforehand and the link is in the description. So that's on November the 14th, uh, next Tuesday. And uh, also, because I did a thing with uh, Damien Talks Money, this is Damien Jordan, uh, who I really like, and uh, we've got a good vibe, very similar philosophy. Uh, we, I went on his podcast, and that did very well, the YouTube video of that uh, interview. I've had him on a YouTube Live before, so I thought it would be kind of fun to do a Christmas special. We don't know the exact date yet, but it'll be just before Christmas, um, but it won't coincide with desperate last-minute shopping, so it'll be early enough before Christmas to still be a Christmas special, but not too close. Um, potentially the 19th, we're not sure. But I think it's going to have this kind of Bing Crosby slash David Bowie vibe, obviously. I'm the old guy. Uh, Damien's the young guy. Um, 
but I think I think we kind of gel quite well together on these YouTube lives and it'll be interesting to talk about the year that's passed but also we'll have some fun Christmas related stuff which we, we're currently discussing it's it'll be funny anyway so yeah I've got a Christmas shirt specially lined up which I bought in Asda uh, flammable wear I call it and um, yeah horrible Christmas shirt in fact uh, I may not wear a hat I'm not sure Anyway, so that'll be just before Christmas. Please do like and subscribe also, and we'll get started. So the first one is a super chat. This is from Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. No, this is a supporter on YouTube. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon, for supporting us on YouTube. And he says, does net asset value really matter? I think it does. I think net, a net asset value does matter. So just to explain, um, I, I suspect what you're talking about is investment trusts. So we've just recorded a podcast on investment trusts. Let me just pull it up while I um, uh, while I talk. Many happy returns uh, podcast. Let's see if I can pull it up. Yes, here we go. So this episode was about investment trusts. Now, if you're not familiar with them, the idea behind investment trusts is they're closed capital. That means they have a fixed pool of capital. It is a company that trades on the stock exchange, just like any other company. It's got a board. It's usually a fund management company. Um, they're actively managed, all of them. They tend to buy illiquid assets. And that's why the fixed pool of capital is really important. Because what you don't want is an open-ended fund where money's sloshing in and sloshing out as popularity waxes and wanes. Then you have forced buying and selling. If money floods in, if it's open-ended, they have to buy more stuff. If money's flooding out, they have to sell stuff. And if the thing you're owning is very illiquid, like infrastructure, like bridges, shopping centres, apartment blocks, well, those are very chunky and very difficult to sell. And they take a long time to sell. So if money's flooding out of the door, you've got no choice but to gate the fund. Whereas if it's closed capital, like an investment trust, then that's not the case. But then the question is, how much is the stuff that the fund owns actually worth? So if you own a portfolio of office buildings in London or office buildings in Montreal or uh, bridges across the world, toll bridges, what are they worth? Because you can't sell them. You can't really value them. If they generate cash flows, you can have a go at discounting the future cash flows. And that's probably your best bet at working out the value. So you often rely on the fund manager to outsource the valuation to someone who's reliable. And that's not always reliable. So what I would say is it's tricky to know whether it's an accurate forecast. Anyway, we did do... Um, an investment trusts episode on many happy returns our podcast you can get this on apple podcast spotify google podcast wherever you get your podcast and we were asking the question are uk investment trusts a bargain so let's have a quick look at uh, uk investment trust just to kind of show you um, what i'm talking about here so let's say we look at scottish mortgage as a kind of bog standard popular investment trust in the uk so this is the price of Scottish mortgage. It's a growth related, invests in growth stocks. So it's very much like ARK K, Cathy Woods Fund. It had a huge rally and then it had a huge crash in 2022. Now notice that during the, there's a kind of light green line here and there's a darker green line. I'm colorblind, unfortunately red green, but <laughs> the net asset value is the upper line here. So that's, Scottish mortgages guess at the value of the stuff that they own and they own all sorts of illiquid companies. Let's have a look at the stuff which is in there. Now some of the stuff is listed stocks, some of it isn't. So let's have a look at the portfolio, just some of it. So ASML, that's a listed stock. It's the company which uh, does lithography for, for, um, for silicon chips. And Moderna obviously is listed Nvidia's listed, Tesla's listed, it didn't used to be. Um, let's find one that is not listed. Well, 
one which I do know, which isn't listed, uh, but which isn't in this list of top ten, is the um, is SpaceX. So not not a listed company, but they own some. So how much is SpaceX worth? Well, you can see what they're launching. You can get an idea of what their future launch schedule's like. You can estimate what it's worth. But it is just a guess. It's an educated guess. But if I want to work out whether it's worth buying, what I'll do is I'll look at the price of the fund relative to its net asset value. And as you can see, at the current time, the current price of the fund is well below the net asset value per share. So the price per share is well below the net asset value per share. So you could say, well, this is looking cheap. So what you do is you work out the Z-score, the surprise value, if you like, of how unusual that discount to NAV is. And so for investment trusts, if you trust the NAV, this is a really good guideline as to when a fund is cheap or expensive. So over the last year, in fact, it's fairly normal for that discount to be that big. But over the longer term, uh, it isn't usual. So during this euphoria period in 2021, you can see that price and NAV tracked each other quite closely. So there was no discount at that point. But currently we've got a discount of 15%, which has been there for a while, since the crash, in fact. So is it a, is it a bargain? Well, if you trust the NAV, yeah, it's looking pretty cheap. Some of these things always trade at a pretty big discount. I don't know if I can find one now. Um, let's certainly look. Um, yeah, let's see if I can find one which... A lot of these energy companies, quite a lot of them have renewable energy and they have really chunky discounts at the moment. Um, yeah, let's see if we can find one at the bottom of this list. Smithson Investment. Yeah, that looks pretty cheap. Here we go. Octopus Renewables Infrastructure. Right, so have a look at the price of this one. So you notice how the nav is kind of jaggedy because it's not updated very often. They guesses as to what the stuff they own is worth. But huge volatility here and a huge discount. So you could say, well, maybe this is fundamentally broken or perhaps this is just cheap. So really, you've got to figure out, based on the stuff that they own and the quality of the management, is this a sector which is finished or is it something which is looking very attractive? And the energy ones in particular are looking pretty cheap at the moment. Um, so, yeah, I, I think NAV is worth it. I think it is interesting if you trust it. And um, as a valuation measure for investment trust, it's really useful. And you can also do things like look at the management, look at their uh, reports. They're often quite well written, quite clear to explain their investment thesis. And, you know, I think I think they're useful. Um, so, yeah, I think I think I think NAV's a useful measure. And it does matter. Uh, next question is from LC. All uh, super chat. Thank you, LC. Uh, super chat. He says, what protection... It was funny last week. Um, <laughs> someone accidentally, accidentally set a super chat for a hundred pounds, and it was a question about pibs. So I was doing my best to answer it as if it was worth a hundred, but of course he'd made a mistake and added an extra digit. So poor guy. Anyway, uh, it all turned out fine. We 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 um. Yeah, it was all fine. Uh, but this one. So what protection? Um, greater than the 85k do pension pots have? Yeah, I mean, I get this question a lot, to be fair. Um, so what protection is there for starters? Um, let me just pull up, uh, what's it called? Octopus. Is it octopus? Yeah, there was a, a Beaufort, that's it. Beaufort Securities is the one everyone talks about. So what are the protections? Well, let me just read you something from Vanguard because this kind of summarises the protections you've got. Firstly, um, 
firm money is always kept separate from client money, so they'll never mix up your stuff with the stuff that's owned by the firm. So let's say your platform that you invest on mixed up their money with yours. If they go into liquidation, the fund platform, the, the platform, the investment platform, then if their money was mixed with yours, the administrator would have difficulty telling the two apart. However, the FSCS, the FCA, the Financial, Con Financial Conduct Authority, keeps the two separate. They force the fund platforms, the investment platforms, to keep those two sets of money completely separate. And that way, when if a company does go into liquidation, they can ensure that your money doesn't get used up to pay the creditors, or at least it would only be used as a last resort. So that's an important thing. Uh, there's also a system of depositories where, you know, if you own stuff, it'll be held by a third party, like winter flood securities. So that's another layer of security. Um, but the segregation, I think, is the most important one. But also the, the, the fact that they have to have a, a lot of regulatory capital. They can't have, you know, they can't run it close to the wire in terms of not having a buffer. The platforms can't. But to be fair, they don't take much risk. You know, there's not a very, vol it's not a very volatile um, business because they don't gamble on markets. It's not like a crypto platform like FTX where they were just betting client money on markets. They don't do that. All they do is they pay their staff. They have a, an IT spend to keep the platform working. They have lawyers. They have compliance. They have marketing departments. Um, so they, they have to keep the lights on, but it's mostly staff costs to keep the company running. So I don't think they're very risky in that sense. So I think, you know, when was the last time a company, one of these platforms um, was at risk? Well, Probably Beaufort Securities is the one, uh, which was a very dodgy company. It was investigated by the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, which accused it of uh, fraud, and uh, it was conspiracy to commit securities fraud. And it was the U.S. Department of Justice that investigated them. And um, yeah, so it was. They they said that the company invented the company. Um, engaged in deceit and manipulative stock trading, and then worked to launder the fraudulent proceeds through offshore bank accounts and the art world. So pretty dodgy stuff. But even then, when the company was liquidated, there was talk of the people who had money on the platform having to pay for it. But in the end, that didn't happen. So even in that really dodgy case, uh, it was fine, and the people were made whole. And then the fund managers themselves, if you own a fund from Vanguard or BlackRock, then again, you know, they're just the guardians of the money. The, the stuff in the fund still belongs to you. So I think those risks are pretty low. Um, so, you know, the FSCS protection is very seldom required. And it's only used if the company itself, by liquidating its assets, can't make you whole which is unlikely, I'd say, because they don't have a lot of debts, these companies usually, investment platforms, because they don't need it. But would I ever worry about this? Probably not. It's not something I concern myself with. I think your personal investment behaviour is much more risky than the platform going down. That's a much bigger risk. And market risk, markets moving around, is a much bigger risk. But platform risk? I don't really worry about it. Some people I speak to, they do split their money amongst multiple funds. So if they have a global index fund, they don't put more than 85K into it. They split it between different investment platforms. So um, it's covered by the guarantee, the 85K guarantee. But, you know, I don't bother. Um, I just don't think it's worth it. But the cost, of course, is mental accounting. You have to use multiple platforms, multiple passwords, and then kind of work out what you own across all of them, which is sometimes a pain. But, yeah, I don't think it's a worry, personally. Um, it was funny, I just saw somebody got grilled. Um, Dave Ramsey. It was, <laughs> it was quite funny. 
he just went off on one. It was one of these YouTube lives like this, I guess. He does a show. Um, he's a US um, YouTube advisor. I don't know if he's an advisor, but anyway, he, he kind of talks about investment like I do. But he completely went off on one when he was talking about withdrawal rates. And he says, yeah, I have an 8% withdrawal rate. I don't have a problem with that. It's an incredibly high withdrawal rate in a, in a, if you're withdrawing your pension. And it's very likely you're going to deplete a pot at a rate of 8% because stocks usually don't manage to keep up at an 8% rate um, if you include volatile periods. So he just got completely grilled on that. It's quite entertaining to watch. So you've got to be careful what you say on these uh, in these sessions. Oh, Laura's uh, typed member. I'm not sure what that means. Is Mr. Hanlon is a member? Yes. Back to your questions. Um, should we summon the dog? I think we should summon the dog right now. Uh, one moment. Daddy. And I've got my stinky treats here. This is my secret weapon now. Laura's got Biltong. I've got oh, Buffalo. Oh, that smells horrible. But he loves it. Look what I've got, Ted. Yeah, Buffalo. I like you. Yes. Oh, oh, oh. He loves that. Oh. I'm so glad you can't smell it because, believe me, you wouldn't like it. You want one more? Yeah? One more. One more. Yes. Oh, yes. Delicious. Brilliant. Okay, back to your questions. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Always. Um... What else have we got? Apparently my bandwidth isn't large enough. Oh dear. Okay. Evening all and Teddy from Festral. Um, question here. Oh, someone says you're rather quiet on the sound mix. Okay. Yeah, people have said that before. I just turn up the volume. I've got a quiet voice as well which doesn't help that's your last one mate you don't want to be sick is it good is it good you're very good you're a very good boy back to laura then back down the stairs to laura no he's hoping for more um who else have we got anthony connolly anthony connolly who says what's the best way to buy government bonds in my sip account well, you need a platform that sells them, uh, single government bonds. Oh, there it goes. She's got built on. Um, so there are many platforms that do. Let me just get a list. So in one of the videos I asked, you know, what guilt platforms are there? And people replied. So one person said XO which is an execution-only platform in the UK, x-o.co.uk. Um, iWeb and Halifax, those are both cheap brokers in the UK. They offer gilts as well. AJ Bell is a pretty low-fee platform. Hargreaves Lansdowne is, a, is not a low-fee platform. Uh, Barclays is a non-popular platform. Um, and interactive brokers as well, apparently. Yeah, I have trouble with interactive brokers. I can't even log into it. I get this 404 error. And a couple of people on our Slack forum have been saying, try connecting via your phone just to see if it's your ISP which is blocking it. So, you know, maybe I should try that. But it's kind of weird that it's blocked, which makes me think, hmm. Oh, it's a big platform. Um, it's a big broker, interactive brokers. Uh, but they do offer gilts as well. But anyway, that's how you do it. You just... Uh, in your SIP account, and there's a video I made about it for members, which you have, if you remember on our website, a premium member on our website, pensioncraft.com, you could you could actually see how to do that. Oh, I've got a new tool, new tool which I've given our members. Let me just share it with you. So it's one of the trackers. 
and there's one for UK gilts. And what's funky about it? You'll like this. It is funky. So what it does is, so this is a list of UK gilts, uh, and my colleague Patrick um, Haddo, he uh, updates it every day. And so you can see, you know, it lists them by maturity date. Um, and of course you can sort by years to maturity. Here's the weird 50 year bond, TR73. So let's do it in uh, ascending order of maturity. So this one matures in 0.227 years. This is TN24. What's cool is if you expand it, firstly, you can get the latest clean, clean price from the LSE by clicking on this link. So this goes to the LSE based on the ISIN code and it tells you the latest prices for it. So you can see this one's just pulling to par now. It's gradually trundling up to 100, which is where it's gonna be at maturity perfectly sure of that and that's going to be on the 31st of January next year it'll be at 100 when it matures and you can see the daily prices you can look at the bid and offer price um, so really it kind of has up to the date up to date pricing but the cool bit is it tells you about the dirty price of crude coupon all of that stuff it splits up yield into income yield and capital gain yield because some of these bonds are very tax efficient because the income yield is low like it is for TN24, the coupon's only an eighth of a percent, and most of the return comes from capital gain. So this one is very tax efficient because you don't pay capital gain on gilts. But the cool bit is you click on this, Wolfram Alpha Calculator. So this launches Wolfram Alpha and it pre-fills all of the fields so that you can work out the yield and kind of verify it. So this says 4.84%, let's just double check. This is 4.69, so it's slightly different from from the one that you see. Oh, sorry, that's Kevin. Yeah, 4.82 is the yield to maturity um, that was given there. But what's cool about it is that if you're about to trade this bond, all you have to do is change one of these numbers. So let's say I get a price of 99. I could very quickly now compute what's the yield to maturity given that new price. Whereas before, you had to kind of type in all the numbers, semi-annual, um, coupon frequency, day count convention, actual, actual. You don't have to bother with all that because um, it's all filled in. So that's what's cool about it, I think. Um, and it's going to work it out really quickly. <laughs> oh, poor Will from Alpha. I love this site. Come on. You can do it. Yes! And the yield to maturity has gone down because the price went up. Okay, but anyway, it's just kind of like a another tool which I'm offering our members. Um, we also have a kind of yield curve tool. Um, let me just go back. Uh, yield curve tool where you can actually see the individual bonds in the yield curve, which is quite useful. Just to see, you know, what the yield is for a given maturity and where the opportunities are on the yield curve. So at the moment still, the short end of the curve is given the best yields, around 5%. Then it falls very sharply up to about five years to a yield of about four and a bit percent. And the size of the blobs tells you which ones are most capital efficient. So you know, this one, uh, which is uh, TG29, a large proportion of the yield for that one is from income and so it's, it's, it's very, um, it's from capital gain, so it's very tax efficient because you don't pay capital gains tax. Anyway, uh, I do try to keep these tools going and kind of um, updated because the members find them useful. You know, it's, there's a lot of dialogue back and forth with the community. They find problems with it, I'll fix them. But that's the beauty of a community, I guess. Um, oh, McCready, hello. Uh, <laughs> he's always so kind. He says, for the Bloomberg Terminal Fund, here's two pounds. Your vids are great. Thank you very much, McCready747. Always a pleasure. My Bloomberg Terminal's that much closer. One uh, accepted to £10,000 a month uh, expense. But anyway, I appreciate it. Cheers. 
Um, right, so back to your questions. How are we doing for time? Please do like and subscribe. Uh, I get in trouble with Laura if I don't say that. What else do we have? Oh, topical. Tom's personal finance. Thoughts on the value factor. It's had a long period of underperformance. Will the value premium return? Let's have a look just to see where we are. Coinfin's great for this um, because it has ETFs, which it kind of has in a dashboard to look at factor performance. It's US based, but it's still interesting um, for UK investors. So this is breaking down growth and value. And this is over a five year period. And what this does is it takes the growth ETF, which is IWF, and divides by the S&P ETF. So it's a ratio of the two. That's the red line. So that when growth outperforms the S&P as a style, the line goes up, as it did here in 2020. Then it kind of flatlined for about a year. Then it fell during the tech rec in 2022. And since 2023 started, you know, it switched back on. So growth has been outperforming, value has been underperforming. So it is almost as if every year God tosses a coin and says, this is a value year, this is a growth year. So it went growth, nothing, value, growth. <laughs> Why? Well, um, I mean, the tech wreck was pretty much to do with valuation, I think, and also interest rates rising. Now we're starting to see interest rates probably peak. So maybe growth will have another hurrah. But what's weird about value is that it worked for so long. It worked for, you know, it hasn't worked for a decade, but it worked for a century before that. So this decade is really weird where growth has outperformed and values underperformed. And that is weird. And it is to do with tech. Tech has been so successful and tech is classified as growth. Maybe what it will take is for growth to start to mature in the, in the US and the Magnificent Seven to become just kind of boring, almost utility like stocks with less aggressive growth in earnings, which is going to happen at some point. It has to. You can't have the whole stock market being, you know, seven stocks. Uh, eventually that will reverse. What was that? I think I heard Laura shout something. Okay. <laughs> um, but but certainly it hasn't seemed to happen yet, which is odd. Um, but will it happen eventually? I think it probably will, because it's something which lasts a century isn't something which just goes away randomly. Um, well, I think Laura was shouting that I wasn't sharing. Right. So this is what I was talking about. So that's a 10-year outperformance. The red line is growth the blue line is value and you can see it's out outperformed for 10 years if we look at five years you can see the coin flipping so growth growth nothing value growth those are the those are the coin flips that i was talking about it's pretty weird but it is driven by these things like interest rates but also tech in the u.s doing incredibly well but yeah eventually tech is going to become boring and something else will take take its place as being exciting because you can't grow earnings at this rate forever. And a lot of the growth in these mega cap tech stocks has been fundamentally driven. They're just cash generating juggernauts which dominate almost every aspect of our lives. That's why they've been so successful. But at a certain point, there's going to be a, a reckoning. Um, usually it's to do with... Um, competitors uh, maybe it'll be a change in society you know maybe we'll just decide to spend less time in front of our computers and live a more um, I don't know paleo lifestyle whatever the change is things eventually come off the boil and you just got to go back you know to previous fads like um, there's a nice tweet that came from Dan Brocklebank who um, give a shout out to uh, him 
so he he's uh, he runs the UK um, the UK um, branch of Orbis, which is a fund manager that actually gives you money back if they underperform. Their fees they pay you back fees if they if they, if they uh, underperform. And what he was pointing out was these stocks called the bunch stocks. Uh, Burroughs, Univac, NCR, Control Data and Honeywell because the cool tech in the 70s was mainframes. Everybody was investing in mainframes because you know you don't need lots of computers. You need maybe a handful of computers to run the world. That was the thinking back then. This is before microcomputers were even a, a, a thing. And so everybody was investing in mainframes. So if you found a mainframe company competing with IBM, which was the, the big dog at the time, well, they were the hot companies and everything was about the bunch companies. Well, a lot of those companies have been absorbed or just don't exist anymore. Um, so, you know, these fads come and go and eventually they end. And I think value at that point will probably come back, maybe because these stocks will become value stocks like Meta did for a while. If you remember, it became classified <laughs> as a value stock. Um, so it might be that these stocks transform into value or it might be that these stocks simply stop being so exciting. Uh, one of those two is going to end the concentration that we see now. So I do think value's coming back. Yeah, it's a very long answer to your very short question. Um, so back to your questions. Um, oh, there's a super chat from John Woodgate. Thank you. Uh, and another thank you. That was a super chat. Uh, oh, John Woodgate, <laughs> yes. That two pounds is another little uh, contribution towards our Bloomberg terminal. I would love a Bloomberg terminal. That's one thing I really miss is a Bloomberg terminal. Um, there's another question from Mr. Hanlon, one of our supporters. He says, any thoughts on VW? Let's take a look at VW. I have, I'm not aware of anything happening with VW, so I'm doing this on the fly. Um, let's have a look. Price and volume. Ooh. So let me share this. So this is what this is what you were talking about, I guess, which is this kind of uh, huge fall in in um, Volkswagen's share price. So let's have a look. This is why I don't invest in single stocks. Let's see what uh, we talked about here. There we go. What's been happening? Oh dear. Sales fall in China. So this is part of a bigger story, I think, which is that um, companies which manufacture cars are seeing a fall in demand. Not entirely surprising, given that inflation is so high and disposable income is falling. And we're seeing these precautionary savings from the pandemic running out. So what are you going to cut back on? It's going to be these big discretionary spends. So that's a problem for Tesla, all the other big car manufacturers, some luxury goods, uh, anything which is a discretionary spend, a large spend, is going to become less attractive. And you listen to what the Fed says. They say, OK, initially at the moment, interest rate sensitive things are slowing down. The housing market, commercial real estate. Eventually, what the Fed expects is there's also going to be a pullback in consumer spending. And what will consumers cut back on? It won't be the small luxuries. It'll be the big luxuries like cars. So it's no surprise that VW has seen sales fall. And I'd expect this for every other, um, every other car manufacturer. But it's the sales drop in China, which is probably worrying investors. So Chief Financial Officer Arno Antl... Arno Antlitz said a 1% drop in the Chinese car deliveries in the first half of the year had forced the group to lower its global delivery target for 2023. Yeah. Uh, whereas at the same time, Mercedes-Benz, which has moved to a strategy of selling more premium cars, so they've actually doubled down and gone even more premium, uh, raised its full year guidance on Wednesday. So you can see that there is a kind of middle ground which is really being heard. Those kind of not terribly expensive cars, but reasonably expensive. But 
super, super expensive cars haven't really fallen much because that part of the uh, demographic in all countries is probably not being so affected by high inflation. They've got lots of cash, lots of money which they can spend, and you know they're not really cutting back on expenditure. And so people in the middle who are exposed to mortgage debt, who haven't paid off their mortgages, who are probably young families, you know, these are the kind of people who will be negatively impacted by higher interest rates and higher inflation. Whereas if you're super wealthy, well, food costs aren't going to bother you, energy costs aren't going to bother you, and higher interest rates probably will benefit you because you're saving at a higher rate. So I think going at very high end is probably a smart move. Yeah, interesting, interesting uh, development. But I think what's interesting about it is a larger macro picture and how it's affecting these these particular sectors. That's what's really interesting. But of course, I'm a macro guy, so I would say that. Uh, but thanks for pointing that out. That's interesting. Um, next question is a super chat, again, from LC. Um, oh, could you please explain the difference between growth and value? Yeah, sure. Um, so these are kind of like two versions, two styles of investing. Warren Buffett is a value investor. He's the most well-known one. The idea is you work out a fundamental value for a stock. So you say, OK, I'm going to guess that this is its future profits. These are the projected profits for this company. I can work out a present value based on some discount rate, based on its cost of capital, and that's the price I believe that Tesla should be, $500, say, just a random number there. Then you look at the actual price of Tesla, and if it's $200, well, that's a screaming buy, according to you. If it's $1,000, then that's too expensive. So that's value investing. First of all, you have to be able to work out the fundamental value of a stock. And once you have one, you can say, well, if it's looking expensive, I won't buy it. If it's looking cheap, I will. The other style of investment is called growth investing, where you're going for companies which are aggressively increasing their profits. And so this would be companies which are like tech stocks. Uh, anything which Cathy Wood buys is essentially a growth stock, or in the UK, which Scottish Mortgage buys. And the managers of Scottish Mortgage once joked People often talk about growth at a reasonable price, GARP. They talk about gro growth at an unreasonable price. They were quite really, quite happy to overpay for growth if they thought it was good enough. So, for example, they bought Tesla when it was still an unlisted stock. They bought SpaceX when it's still unlisted. So GERP is their approach, growth at an unreasonable price. Because, you know, if, if they believe in a company, they'll buy significant amounts of it. And so this kind of conviction investing is pretty much what goes hand in hand with the growth uh, style of investing if it's actively managed. But you can also buy growth funds which aren't actively managed. They're passively managed. So let's have a look at one just to see how it's defined. Um, and Coifin's probably a good place to start for that. So that I'll, I'll share my screen in one second once I get this uh, factor thing back in front of us. So here's the factor style of investing again. So the factor one is IWF. Now that's an iShares fund. And because iShares is awesome, they have really good fact sheets. So this, go, so this actually tracks the Russell 1000 growth ETF, which tracks the Russell 1000 growth index. Now I was hoping it was going to be an MSCI one. Let's see if we can find an MSCI growth one. That's probably better. Because MSCI's fact sheets are just awesome. So here's a growth index created by the index company MSCI. So let's just see their definition. The growth investment style characteristics for index construction are defined using five variables. Long-term forward earnings per share growth rate. So how quickly is it growing its profits over the next five years? That's a guess, of course, but it's a guess which is reasonable, I guess. Uh, Short-term forward earnings per share growth rate, so um, so so it's kind of long-term growth rate for profits is high. Short-term growth rate is forecast to be high, so short and long-term. 
internal growth rate is high and long-term historical EPS growth trend and long-term historical sales per share growth trend. So looking backwards, it's grown its top line, its revenue, as well as its profits um, over the last many years. So historically, it's grown its profits and revenue. In the future, it's forecast to grow its profits. So that's what we're looking for. And of course, tech stocks have fallen into that category. So if we see the highest weights in that index, well, look, it's just the mega cap. It's a magnificent seven. It's Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Nvidia, Google, Alphabet, Meta, and Tesla, and a pharma company and Visa. So those make up 40% of the index. So you can see that that's the style of investing. Whereas if we look at MSCI value, it'll be a very different group of stocks. And this is a great way to learn about styles. Is just look at these fact sheets and you'll pick up very quickly just by looking at the type of stocks, how they work. So value is defined um, using three variables in this case, book to value price. So that's an accounting measure of value. What's the, what are the assets of the company worth relative to its price? Uh, what's the 12 month forward earnings price to um, forward earnings to price ratio? And what's the dividend yield? So all three of those are different ways of measuring cheapness relative to its dividends, relative to its forecast profits and relative to its book value. And it uses all three criteria to specify which stocks are cheap and it buys lots of those. So let's see what those stocks are. And these will be very different, I'm sure. Yeah, so boring stuff, you know, United Health Group, Berkshire Hathaway, they buy Warren Buffett. Uh, JP Morgan Chase, a boring bank, maybe not so boring. Um, uh, Johnson & Johnson, a healthcare company. Procter & Gamble, you know, really not very exciting companies. Um, energy companies, so well, there's one consumer discretionary here, which is, um, which is Home Depot. Um, but you can see very different from that growth set of companies. So that's the styles that we're talking about. And I think I think eventually those exciting companies will become boring companies as their earnings growth starts to slow down, as they saturate their markets, as competitors eat away their, their, their profits. That's usually what happens. And that's how I think the growth rally will probably end. Um, something else will come along. Or society will change and that just won't be cool anymore. Anyway, that's what I'd expect. It could take a long time, though, you know, to be fair. You know, these poor value investors, they've been hurting for so long, um, just waiting for it to come back. Uh, so let's all spare a thought for Clifford Asnes. Yes, we should have a moment silence for him. So back to your questions. And how are we doing for time? We've got tw uh, 12 minutes. And let's see what we've got. Okay, somebody says, oh, it's Laura, I think. Say hi to Michael Pugh. Hi, Michael. How's it going? Uh, he's my co-host for the podcast. Amazingly bright guy. Brilliant to work with. Thank you, Michael. Um, and he says, I think Laura says, about time he did another live Q&A with you. And it is. Okay. <laughs> Michael was great, actually. He was uh, he was a bit nervous beforehand, but he was just amazing. Um and we've got a good vibe, right? So we, we work very well together. Um, yeah. So hi, Michael. And there's a super chat from Damatsa, who says, thank you for the super chat, first of all. Enjoyed your recent two fund versus three fund portfolio. Please do more analysis on varying each asset class according to the market temperature, e.g. reducing the stocks portion when the stock market is relatively high. I've done that in the past, and in fact, valuations are a very poor indicator for when to dial back on risk because these rallies tend to go, they tend to overshoot, right? Even if valuations are high, they just get higher or they stay high. It's not a good indicator for timing, and it's also not a good indicator for dialing back on risk, weirdly. 
I mean, you might intuitively think, well, markets are expensive, sell some stock and buy bonds. When markets are cheap, buy more stocks and less bonds. It should be that simple, shouldn't it? But it isn't because, because of these kind of trends which overextend and markets stay cheap for longer than they should maybe. Um, but the cheapness thing usually works. You know, usually there's a five year, 10 year period after markets are cheap when uh, returns are higher than usual. But remember that most people aren't in a situation where they can, where they can invest more. They're earning money, they're saving money and investing as they go. So really all you could do is dial up and down the risk in your portfolio based on valuation, which may or may not work. It, and my back tests certainly show that it doesn't work. Um, so yeah, uh, I have tried it. <laughs> it doesn't work. So the way I did it, that just to explain it, is I built up money in a bond fund when valuations were above a critical level. And I tried different valuation measures. I tried the excess CAPE yield. I tried CAPE itself, uh, Schiller's measures. And so I held back money when stocks were expensive, built it up in a bond fund. And then when valuations fell below a critical level, I just put everything into stocks at that point. And I varied the threshold as well. And there's no threshold at which that works. It never really worked. There was a threshold where it worked better. Um, but the upward trend of stocks is just very hard to beat. That's the long and short of it. Just being fully invested works really well. So, so beating that is, is very difficult. So just putting as much as you can into stocks and holding them as long as possible sounds like a dumb strategy, but it works incredibly well and it's very difficult to beat. Um, that's why um, that's why it didn't work. But uh, yeah. I've forgotten the name of the video, but yeah, I certainly did a video on that. Uh, more super chats, thank you. Uh, one from Matthew Dick, who says, um, "Why?" Who gave us five pounds? Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, well, of course, now I'm used to hundred. You know, that was a mistake. Why are rising yields on U.S. Treasury seen as a problem? Red flag. Is this due to some people becoming distressed sellers before maturity? I think, I think rising yields per se themselves are not a problem. It's the rate at which they rise which is causing a bit of consternation. Let's have a look at the yields just to kind of make that absolutely clear. Uh, yeah. So here's the US yield um, on the one year, 20 year and 10 year. So here we are, the zero interest rate period uh, post pandemic. Then the short end starts to pick up, long end picks up as well, and you get pretty rapid rises. Then you get this discontinuity here. So we went from a yield of what? 2.2 uh, in June. Um, and over the space of a couple of weeks, we went to 3.1. So that's a huge move for the bond market. That is a cataclysm. And then, you know, here's a huge fall downwards, right? And that was in um, March of 2023. And then recently it's been kind of spiking up again. Um, so I think people are worried about liquidity in the market. You know, if treasury markets become illiquid, the half a trillion dollars a day market suddenly starts to be difficult to trade. That's a big deal. Because this is literally the financial glue, the lubricant, if you like, not glue, the lubricant that makes things work. And if the financial plumbing breaks with treasuries, that's a big deal. And look, you know, there was a story about this today in the FT. Um, really shocking. <laughs> so it's a ransomware attack on ICBC, which is a Chinese bank, disrupts trades in the US Treasury market. Now, so, there's a lot going on in that ex in that uh, title. Firstly, it's a Chinese bank, and then you're thinking, well, surely they had security in place to try and avoid this kind of hacking. But it's a ransomware attack, so you can bet some arsehole somewhere is saying, unless you give me some Bitcoin, I'm going to trash your systems. Well, you know, that's atrocious on one level, 
that a big Chinese bank had that kind of security hole. But then why is a Chinese bank disrupting US, the US Treasury market? And how much, how much do they have in terms of Treasury clout uh, in order to let that happen? So the story seems to be that the attack prevented ICBC from settling Treasury trades on behalf of other market participants. Um, so obviously they were trading some pretty big accounts for, on behalf of some pretty big accounts in China. Um, but very worrying, very worrying. Yeah, but even big companies like Allen and Overy, the big law firm, um, had a ransomware attack recently. So nobody's kind of immune to this stuff. But, you know, people are worried about, about this because it's such an important part of the financial plumbing. And if that breaks, if treasuries break, then, you know, it's really worrying. Um, but look, things like growth stocks, if interest rates increase, it pushes down on, on the value of growth stocks. So, you know, the tech wreck was pretty much a response to that increase in yields in 2022. So that's a worry. Uh, and people are just not used to yields being high. You know, they don't remember when yields were above 5%. I do, because I'm really old. But for other people, it's weird. And if we do look further back, of course, uh, then you can see that over a 10 year period, the yields that we see now, actually, you'd have to go further back, um, are not that unusual. If we look at Fred, um, I don't know, 20 year treasury yield. Here we go. So these are the constant maturity yields for US treasuries. And let's go back a long time. So the, oh, there's a gap for this one, isn't there? Uh, DGS 30, I think there isn't a gap for this one. Yeah. Um, so let's go back to 1980. You can see that current yields look high because, you know, it's 5%. And they haven't been this high since, you know, before the global financial crisis. So that's why it's a shock, I think. You know, so the levels are unusual. It's, you know, probably beyond most people's careers when it was this high. And the rate at which they've increased has been unusual. And that's that's scary. And these discontinuities and ransomware attacks in China just make things worse. And there's a lot of talk about a lack of liquidity in the treasury market as well, which kind of freaks people out, which is understandable. Uh, if anything, if there's any market which I wouldn't want to go wrong, it's the treasury market. That's really what you don't want to go wrong. Um, that's certainly true. So I think that's why people are scared. I hope that answers your question. Top Pleb, good name. Um, also Super Chat, five Canadian dollars. Thank you very much. Any thoughts on the newfound popularity of zero day options trading or Wall Street bets in general? Yeah. Um, so if people are not familiar with it, this is when you have very short term options, which are very popular with investors um, who are just basically gambling. Because uh, at this point, Let's say it's just a day to go on a on a on a call option. If it if if the if the stock that it's so let's say the okay let's look at one. Um, but you get huge fluctuations in the price of a call option, which is an option to buy a stock at a fixed price at a fixed point in time. As you get closer and closer to the maturity date, the value of the option either goes to zero over a short period of time or it goes to an incredibly high number. So if it starts off out of the money, let's say it's a day before, or I don't know, a week before maturity, a week before expiry, not maturity, a week before expiry, the price is nine, is 100, no, no, 99. So it's not quite in the money. The value of that option as it gets closer to maturity will fall very close to zero. So if you buy the option at that point, it'll be worth pennies, it's very cheap. But then if it moves up above the call strike, then it becomes valuable. So this is a very leveraged bet on essentially the toss of a coin because nobody can predict what stocks will do over the course of a week. Nobody. It's a guess. It's a gamble. And people like it because it's, it's, it's like gambling. You've got the short term pay payoff. It's exciting. It's exhilarating. 
potentially large payoffs and you get an immediate hit. So it's very unlike investing. This is gambling. So I think it should be regulated like gambling. And I don't think people should be allowed to spend a huge amount of money on these on these type of investments. They're not investments, they're gambles. Um, so I think options for this reason, you know, the leverage, the potentially large losses, and the fact they're being used by people who probably don't understand them, um, worry me and can people make money with these you could you could get lucky and make money with them but I don't think they're good um, do they do they provide a valuable service to society no it is just gambling on derivatives and most people are going to come unstuck doing this um, so yeah I'm not particularly keen you can probably tell but it's very much against the philosophy which I have which is to be a long-term investor and it shouldn't be like gambling. It should be something that fits with your normal lifestyle, you know, like mowing the lawn or, um, you know, washing the dishes. It's, it should be boring. Investing should be boring if you do it right. And this is not boring. It's, it's, it's exciting and it is gambling. And it's very unlikely to work. That's the other point. The reason why I think long term investing is good is because it works most of the time. You've just got to be patient. Um, and a lot of people aren't patient and they want the quick payoff. They want the multi-baggers. You know, if there's one phrase in finance I hate, it's it's multi-baggers, you know, <laughs> stocks which go up like tenfold. I think that's that's just not investing. But look, there's my rant. Uh, let's just see if you've got any other questions. And one more, one more, and then I'll go because it's eight o'clock. Um, no more questions, please. Um, Con Con MC. Super chat, thank you. Uh, two pounds. Hi, Roman. Could you quickly explain the difference between MSCI quality versus MSCI growth? Yeah. Well, firstly, it's these are indices created by MSCI. If you're a fund manager, you can track these indices. You pay a fee to MSCI. They'll give you the weights and the stocks on a daily basis, so you can replicate the index. So you can have funds that track these two indices. These are two styles of investing. Uh, MSCI quality goes for companies which tend to have low leverage, good return on equity. In other words, they have a kind of steady um, increase in their profits also. And uh, did I mention not too much leverage so that they're not taking too much balance sheet risk? So quality, I mean, we can actually look at the um, fact sheet. We've already done growth, I think. Quality PDF. And these fact sheets are great. You know, if you do want to learn about this, they're freely available. Um, here we go. So high return on equity, stable year on year earnings growth. So the profits are steadily rising and low financial leverage. So return on equity is um, is also one of the criteria um, but, but basically the idea here is that you go for quality companies and if you look at a, at a fund like Fundsmith for example a very popular active fund in the UK that's one which is pretty close in style to, um, uh, to, to one of these quality indices and quality is actually outperforming Fundsmith at the moment um, which is interesting but that's the difference, right? So it's different styles of investing, different types of factor investing, where you go for companies which are high quality. And at the moment, let's just have a look at that, actually, because that's interesting as well. If you look at the kinds of stocks which are quality funds, quality, quality stocks, it is the Magnificent Seven. It is NVIDIA, Microsoft, Apple, Meta, Eli Lilly, Visa, so, you know, um, and Alphabet. So quality is pretty much the same as as growth at the moment, which is interesting. Um, they won't be identical, but they're pretty similar. So a lot of these Magnificent Seven stocks are highly weighted in these indices. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's the difference between the two. I'll just go back to your question to make sure I answered it. So it's that versus 
growth. Yeah, so growth would be much more aggressively earning, growing its earnings and with, without a care about balance sheet leverage, um, which isn't one of the criteria, remember. Uh, so that's that's a difference between the two. But but it really the, the definitions will depend on the index provider. Different index providers will come up with different definitions. So really you've got to check what the actual definition is for the fund that you're buying. But philosophically, they're all kind of similar in that sense. Um, so I hope that answers your question. And I think we're about done. Um, so uh, thank you all for joining us. Please do like and subscribe. Don't forget, I've got a thing which I'm doing next Tuesday for C-Bonds, a uh, free, free webinar, which I'm doing with C-Bonds. You have to register for it beforehand. You'll find the link in the description to do that. And uh, please do show up for it. I think it'll be good if you want to learn about fixed income investing. A bit more advanced than I usually talk about that kind of thing. So you'll pick up some new stuff maybe. Um, and uh, we've also got a live special I'm doing with Demo uh, for the Christmas uh, period for the um, so it'll be just before Christmas and uh, that should be a lot of fun so yeah please do join us for that and for the C-Bonds thing take care everyone and good luck with your portfolios over the next two weeks